Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Guru. I am honored that you're here listening today and getting some, hopefully, some really life-empowering information on how you can live your most fulfilling life from the most mentally strong place possible. I am joined today again by my co-host, Tierney Ray, who's going to help me out with the conversation. So, Tierney, thanks for being here again. Thank you again for having me. I'm really Uh, looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited as well for a number of reasons, as you'll find out through this conversation. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of an intro and a background on uh, our guest today, whose name is Michael Fine. Michael and I um, have been best friends uh, since we were kids, two or three years old. We went to kindergarten together and we've remained best friends ever since. So this uh, story today um, about him overcoming tragedy is, is very personal and uh, very inspiring to me. As, as him being obviously a dear, dear friend of mine. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, uh, Michael's story. I'm not gonna give you too much because I want it to unfold in the podcast, um, but it is a very inspiring story of overcoming tragedy and dealing with something that happens and, and having a choice of mind on how you're going to react and how the power of that choice has such an incredible impact on every moment of your life. Um, But I'm going to let Michael tell uh, most of that story. So here's just a brief intro to Michael and and what caused this to all happen. In 2010, while driving down a two-lane highway on the way to work on a gorgeous Chicago morning, a flatbed construction truck crossed the middle line and hit Michael head-on, crushing the whole left side of his car. Michael was in a convertible and had his left arm hanging leisurely out the window. He had no time to react. On impact, Michael lost his entire left arm from the shoulder down, but miraculously he survived, which he will tell you all about. Today, we're gonna talk about his life up to that moment, how he survived that tragic incident and what it's meant to his life since then. So Michael, thanks for being such an inspiration and thanks for being here today on the podcast. Uh, so it's my pleasure and, uh, and my honor to be, uh, to be with my oldest, uh, dearest friend uh, and uh, a new friend uh, as well. Mm. Uh, you know, Howard has played uh, and continues to play uh, a tremendous part in this story that I'm going to talk to you uh, about today. Uh, you know, the brief synopsis that, uh, that Howard just gave you uh, is, uh, is indeed true. Um, you know, uh, there are a lot more details uh, that we could spend uh, hours to hit the salient points. Uh, that, that truck did hit me head on. It uh, ripped my arm off at the shoulder. Um, and uh, But for the heroics of uh, an amazing human being driving in the adjacent lane who uh, had the mm-hmm. presence of mind to stop his car, pick up the arm, marshal a bunch of people around us and fashion a tourniquet out of tree twigs and rags uh, from a forest that was right next to where the accident occurred, uh, I never would have made it out of the accident site. Uh, and then- uh, Hold, hold on a we, second, before you go any further, we got to unpack that a little bit because that yeah. <laughs> you, you went over that a little quick here. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> all right, so let me get this straight just as we're going into this particular part of the story. Sure. The accident occurs, there's a guy right behind you who's driving in a car. He sees what happens. He comes he rushing stops, up. He stops mm-hmm. his car, gets out. He picks notices up my that, arm you, that you lost your left arm and you're losing a ton of blood. Correct. And he decides he doesn't have anything. So he grabs twig branches nearby from a bush or a tree, fashions correct. them together and uses it as a tourniquet. Am I getting that couple, correct? A couple people came around the accident site as well. They came out of their houses because there are houses across the street from this forest reserve and a lady came out with a towel and he took the towel and the tree twigs and kind of wrapped them around my shoulder where my arm used to be and uh, tightened them around my shoulder and just twisted and twisted and twisted till he uh, was able to cut off the blood flow uh, like a spigot. I'm I'm only doing this from what was described to me. I I don't really have any recollection of any of these things occurring. I remember up to the moment of impact, a big red blur, uh, coming into my face. And uh, that was about all I remember. Uh, I still haven't really 
uh, found any of those memories uh, just uh, just yet. Uh, but that's uh, that's what I was told. Wow! So he basically wow. saved your life. No, he didn't. Basically, he did save my life. Yeah. Uh, my, my kids grew up calling this guy uncle. Uh, uh, he's an earth angel. Uh, I'm the yeah. third person he saved. Yeah. Uh, so literally, he's an mm-hmm. earth angel. He's just in the right place at the right time. He's not a doctor. No medical training. Just uh, you know, had the presence of mind, you know, to uh, slow everything down in a moment of crisis, and uh, you know, knew what to do. And uh, I still see him uh, a little less uh, these days uh, based on the COVID, but we get together every, uh, every anniversary, April 14th, uh, my rebirth day, uh, the day I didn't yeah, die or the day I was reborn, <laughs> depending on your perspective. And uh, we have dinner and uh, we talk throughout the year and uh, probably the greatest person you'd ever want to meet. Yeah. Doesn't think he did a thing to this day. Yeah, uh, on occasion, yeah. tries to pick up dinner you know, which is like the most amazing thing ever because I tell him he's got a lifetime pass for ever paying for anything uh, when he's with me. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, just a beautiful, beautiful uh, human being. That's amazing. Um, by the way, um, just as a small plug, the, the whole story is in Time in a Bottle. Um, I've got a, a whole half a chapter dedicated to Michael and this whole story uh, because it's so inspiring. So I'm going to ask you a pretty direct question. What was your first thought when you woke up in the hospital? Wow. I mean, I, I spent six weeks in the hospital after this accident. Um, the first uh, five, five, six days were in the ICU. Uh, so when I first woke up in the ICU, you know, I got to the hospital and uh, uh, for the second time that, li- uh, that day, my life was saved by a, an amazing orthopedic trauma surgeon who worked on me for 14 hours and uh, saved me for the second time that day. Uh, although I woke up, you know, completely, uh, drugged out on, uh, some incredibly powerful, uh, drugs, uh, Dilaudid, uh, intravenous, uh, you know, opioids. And I still, to this day, feel the left arm as if it was still attached to my body. So when I woke up, I just wondered where I was and still felt my arm and I was all wrapped from the neck down, almost like a mummy. So I didn't really notice obviously that the arm was gone. Uh, they came in and told me and I didn't believe them quite frankly. Uh, Cause like I said, I still feel the arm as if it was attached to my body. It still feels as if it's encased in a block of ice being squeezed all the time, um, but still attached. Uh, so it was literally a disbelief like, wow, how can that be? Because I still feel it. And, um, you know, I, I didn't really know how to, how to cope at that point. Uh, still drugged out and, you know, really, really disoriented from, uh, from the accident. Okay. okay. Interesting. And then as the days unfolded, I, I, I flew in the second day. Um, yes, 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 he did. My oldest and dearest friend hopped a plane and was uh, by my bedside, you know. Yeah. Um, one of my first visitors aside from my my family yeah and i can i can attest that pretty much you know within when we were by ourselves the first hour in there um a, a really incredible amazing obviously the question anybody would ask came up for you which is you know you you basically said how, how am i going to get through this and I, my response was based on the work that i had been doing but but it was it, I, the appropriate response at the time, I thought, which was however you choose to. Hmm. And I think that that resonated and, and you know, it, it took some time, but you can kind of take it from there and kind of see what happened after that. And, and you know, there was, a, there was a road to the acceptance part of this, correct? It was a powerful time. Um, and, and it was, uh, you know, after that accident, you know, again, I was in the hospital for six weeks. I had undergone eight surgeries in the first two weeks that I was there. Uh, so eight times of full-on anesthesia uh, being rolled down the hallway, <laughs> taken into surgery and, and pulled out as they reconstructed my shoulder and, and did a bunch of skin grafts on my body to, How many you know, to, uh, to sew up the gaping hole of where, where the arm used to be. How many surgeries uh, was it? Eight, eight that first uh, okay. two weeks, two more wow. at the end of the year, uh, one more this, uh, you know, this past year. Uh, our or two years ago, I don't even remember. I think I'm capped out at 11, uh, at least for a while. Um, 
And, uh, and yeah, it was a, a very, very interesting time. Uh, there was a lot of other baggage behind the, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the accident. I was, uh, I was not at a high point in my life at the time of the accident. I, uh, uh, I was severely depressed. Um, you know, uh, I had owned, uh, I'm a recovering attorney by profession, uh, but I had owned a mortgage company and, uh, you know, 2008, you know, was the, uh, uh, the financial apocalypse, you know, unlike the, uh, the current apocalypse that we're living in now with the coronavirus, it was the financial apocalypse. Uh, so I had gone from making a tremendous living to making almost nothing. Um, a couple months prior to that accident, uh, I lost my father. Um, a couple months after that accident, uh, my mom was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer uh, and given six months to live. Uh, the guy who hit me had minimal insurance coverage uh, in the state of Illinois, which was $10,000 of coverage that didn't even cover my car. Uh, My health insurance company at the time, uh, which was before the Affordable Care Act was in place, and I was self-employed, initially started out great. And then after a couple months, I stopped returning our phone calls. And uh, they denied every bill. Uh, That six-week stay in the hospital uh, helped me rack up about $650,000 worth of medical bills. And my health insurance carrier at the time tried to cancel my policy and didn't pay any bills for more than a full year. Uh, so as I you know, fought to recover and to heal, uh, we were getting calls from collection agencies, doctor's offices, uh, all looking for money to pay for these surgeries and pay for all these hospital bills. Um, you know, and that spiraled me down into a deep, uh, dark, uh, suicidal depression. Uh, I spent about a month and a half of my life, uh, trying to, to kill myself. Uh, well, my wife, my two young boys at the time slept up in their beds at night. Uh, I was in my basement with a belt around my neck over a door, uh, or in my garage with the car turned on and door closed or at a bathroom sink with a knife at my wrist, uh, trying, trying to end it. Um, I don't think it culminated with me taking a bottle of pills. Uh, My wife, my oldest son at the time in seventh grade came home and found me on the kitchen floor, rushed me back to that same hospital that I had emerged a couple months back as a hero, not for doing anything special, just not dying. Um, uh, Now back into a ward where they took my shoelaces, my belt uh, on 24 hour watch, um, wondering how, (laughs) how I fell so far, so fast, uh, how I was now trapped in a facility with drug addicts and alcoholics, no judgment, just, oh my God, how did I fall so far so fast? Uh, Wondering, you know, how and why (laughs) I wanted to move forward. Um, By some act of God, Allah, Buddha, Jesus, energy, whatever it is that you choose to call it, quite frankly, I think it's all the same thing. And as long as you come from a good place, I'm completely fine with whatever it is that you believe. Um, I came out of that hospital, you know, uh, looking for a a new way forward. Uh, Coincidentally, that was about the exact same time, (laughs) a couple months after uh, that, uh, this really interesting book came out by this really interesting new author with no initials after his last name or fancy titles, uh, a book called I Am, The Power of Discovering Who You Really Are uh, by this guy named Howard Falco. (laughs) (laughs) And I remember uh, actually being, and I had seen an advanced copy of the book uh, when I was coming out of the hospital. And again, when Howie came out uh, initially when I was in the hospital, I went from a very low point to a very high point in a very short period of time. Uh, You know, a lot having to do with the, how I chose to move forward. Uh, And it was a very, very quick rise. Uh, Many of my doctors uh, said I was manic. I was on a huge, huge uh, prescription pill diet of lots of different things for pain, for uh, anxiety, for many, many different things. Um, however, I don't attribute, uh, all of that to, uh, to mania. I really attribute it to a choice of, uh, this is what I'm going to do now. And now it's just figuring out how to do it. 
but the choice was made to heal. You know, as soon as this happened, uh, you know, as soon as Howie and I had that discussion when, uh, when he came out, um, the depression came after all the other things that I just told you about and kind of like a, a tree being slowly whacked with an ax and chopped down. That was kind of how I, how I fell down into my, uh, my depression. Uh, I came out of the depression, you know, or not out of the depression, out of the hospital, looking for a new way forward. Uh, how? How was I going to get my life back? How was I going to get off a prescription pill diet of about 35 pills a day? Uh, how was I going to get my head around this pain that I still feel every single day, every moment, every hour, 365 days a year? How, how was I going to create a new normal? And I started reading Howie's book. Um, and <laughs> I remember, you know, <laughs> to this day, I remember reading the summary section in chapter was it 12 or 13, yeah. Yeah, 12. I think page 185 or 186. Yeah. Uh, and it was summarizing the book up until that point. And again, my oldest son found me on the floor that morning uh, after I'd taken that bottle of pills. I don't think I was trying to kill myself at that point. I was just at the lowest possible point and it was my final cry for help. I could have taken a bottle of opioid narcotics and it would have ended right there. I took a bottle of Lyrica, which aside from constipating me really badly and making me drink some terrible tar chalky stuff to help, uh, you know, pump my stomach. That was about the worst thing that happened from that stuff. But I was living on a treadmill of guilt and shame and remorse because that was the day I effectively took my beautiful 12 year old boy's childhood from him. That was the day that he, unfortunately had to become a man and see something that was so terrible. His father um, basically giving up and, and uh, trying to kill himself. And I just couldn't get off that treadmill. I remember reading Howie's book that day and that chapter, that summary, that the line in the book said, you do the best that you can in any given moment that you're in. And your best, your best is always good enough. When that resonated with me and really sunk in, it was like getting hit in the head by a lightning bolt. It was like seeing life in one moment in black and white, and the next minute seeing it in full-on 3D technicolor. And at that moment, I was able to, to come to terms with what had happened. I wasn't proud of it. I still regret it. But I was able to say to myself that, you know what? That was the best that I had that day. I'm not proud of it. But now I choose to live a different life. I choose to show my son, my wife, my friends, my family, that I'm not that guy anymore. And it's not about falling. We all fall. Everybody falls down. Uh, it's about getting up. It's about the will, the tenacity, the desire to keep moving forward, which really is what, you know, I chose to define me. And mm -hmm. from that day, I can honestly tell you that everything changed. Um, you know, I started seeing I, life through eyes of gratitude. Yeah. yeah. And, and once that happened, the world transformed, um, you know, and has been transforming ever since that day. And it'll be 11 years in, uh, in April, in a couple months. Wow, that was quick. Um, Howard, can I chime in? Yeah, yeah please, anything. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I, let, me stop, I, let me stop talking, please. <laughs> well, I've been just sitting back, like taking it all in. I mean, it's hard to even fathom how, what you are feeling, like going through all the, it's like one thing after another, just defeat. It's like, you probably felt overwhelmed, but then at a certain point, like just numb, like you shut down. Um, and so I'm just curious when you were, you know, in the hospital, did you start even kind of like processing this new reality for you or, or did it take you kind of coming back into your real life to kind of come to terms with this new normal for yourself? And yeah, that's a, it's, that's a great question, Tony. I, you know, again, I, after the initial accident, things kind of went straight up. 
I had a pretty easy existence in the hospital. You know, at that point, I really wasn't worried about medical bills because I thought I had insurance uh, and I thought everything was covered and paid for. So I wasn't too worried from that standpoint. It was just really a focus on healing, making it through these surgeries. I had a bunch of physical therapy in the hospital. Once I got out of the hospital, my insurance told me that I had 14 physical therapy visits. That's all I had. That's all I covered. Back then, it was a little different. Like I said before, the Affordable Care Act that gave you unlimited physical therapy based on your need. So 14 visits after you lose your arm really wasn't quite enough to, um, you know, to, to gain the, the stability and the balance, you know, physically, mentally, uh, spiritually, emotionally uh, that, uh, that, that you needed. So while I was in the hospital, it was pretty much, you know, uh, a shot straight up, almost like a rocket. You know, I had my best friend there. We created this beautiful, uh, you know, healing uh, prayer mantra that I read every day that still hangs by my bedside uh, that I look at every morning when I wake up. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> and it no, was, uh, no, they were yeah, <clears throat> I'm sorry. No, I was just saying the, the mantra is oh. actually in the book. Uh, oh, yeah, the mantra is in the book as well. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, and yeah, so it, it was, it was an upward spiral, but coming back into reality and, and then having all these other things happen and then settling back into, okay, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? How am I going to yeah. do this? How am I going to do that? And it was weird, you know, everyone wanted to help me in the beginning and, and you know, and people still do. Um, and it was wonderful and heartwarming to have so much support. I can tell you honestly that I wouldn't be here today if I didn't have all the support that I had from yeah. friends, from family, from, from, uh, from people. But sometimes, you know, you need to step back a little bit and allow people to go through what they're going through and mm -hmm. ask for help as opposed just to go in and grab something before they, because it was a process, you know, listen, I have one arm. There's certain things I can't do. Okay. And over time I have adapted the best that I can. Uh, I have a ball. Un, yeah. It's unbelievable. I, mean, <laughs> I have a I, ball I on my steering wheel. Yeah. I, yeah. There's amazing. certain things that I can't do still though. And when I can't do can, them, I he, ask for help. He can hit a golf ball 250 yards though. That's <laughs> wow. pretty amazing. Yeah. It's incredible. <laughs> and so Michael, you said like in the beginning, you had that sensation of feeling like your arm was still there. And so was it kind of a gradual process of you like realizing like, oh, I mean, I can't imagine how you adjust to it in an instant. I mean, how long did it take you to fully yeah, it, accept I mean, it on a physical level? I, you know, it's, I, don't, I don't still reach for things with my left arm, <laughs> but again, I still feel it. Okay. So I still feel as if it's attached to mm -hmm. my body. It's mm -hmm. like, kind of like a miniature arm, uh, which is a hard thing to describe. And I can... I can, it's, it's like this right now. I can move it. I can't open and close my hand. Uh, although I can tell you that every time I finish practicing yoga, my hand is open. Um, and the more pain I feel yeah. is yeah. when my hand is clenched into a fist and I can't really control it. But after every class and I'm talking like, I don't know, probably 2,500, 3,000 yoga classes in, in 11 years, every time I finish that hand is open and I feel less pain. But just to clarify, yeah. you're talking about your phantom hand that feels frozen. After you do yoga, the phantom hand feels open and, and less pain. Yeah, it feels like, so, exactly. Okay. Every single I just time. To clarify that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the phantom, my, fan, my phantom hand. On uh, your left side. On my left side, yeah. So you feel that sensation. I still feel Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like wow, okay. Yeah, I still feel it. It's called phantom pain. The, the medical term is called chronic residual limb pain syndrome. Uh, so, you know, and you hear quite a bit about it, you know, especially with, uh, you know, all the, uh, uh, the soldiers coming back from uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, where, you know, limbs are ripped off or, or blown off. Uh, the only real thing that I have ascertained over, you know, almost 11 years now is that based on how the limb is amputated, whether it's a clean surgical cut versus a blown off, ripped off, pulled off kind of uh, uh, separation, the people that have, you know, the limbs taken off in that way seem to suffer from much more phantom pain. You know, there's millions and millions of nerves in the arm, um, you know, and when, when it's ripped off, those nerves are still there. They're frayed and they're stretched. So there's no way you can go in and cauterize each one of them to, 
to dull the sensation. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that, you know, and that's really what brought me to the, to the yoga that I, that I practice and I teach uh, because I needed to find a new way forward uh, to deal with this chronic residual limb pain to help get off these pills. And I went very Eastern in my approach to, to healthcare, uh, acupuncture, Reiki, cranial sacral therapy, sensory limitation, flotation, cryotherapy, you know, massage therapy, cupping, you know, you name it, I, I've tried it. And all those things are wonderful modalities uh, that, that helped me tremendously. Um, and I, I, I wound up finding the yoga that I teach and I practice, you know, via my acupuncturist at the time. Who described, so you had, never, you had never done yoga before? No, I had never practiced no. any type of yoga uh, before this accident. Um, and I'd grown up in the martial arts uh, for many years. So it's not that it was a completely foreign concept to me. Um, and my acupuncturist, I, I, and I'd found, originally I'd found a, you know, one of my friends, uh, dear friend, uh, had studied, uh, you know, uh, Anusara yoga uh, with uh, Anna Forrest. And after my accident, my, my balance was just way off. I mean, physically, mentally, in every way, uh, my balance was off, but physically balanced. I was bumping into stuff. I was falling down a lot, you know, because when you, you don't have that equal weight distribution of the two arms, you know, and you've had it your whole life and suddenly one day it's gone, my balance was off. So she came over to my house as I was, you know, healing and showed me some yoga postures just to, uh, to develop and strengthen my core and uh, work on my balance. That turned into me uh, gradually going to practice with her and doing some, uh, some vinyasa yoga that turned into hot vinyasa yoga. And uh, the heat helped me a little bit with the pain. Um, I, felt, I felt good in, in the heat. Uh, however, you know, because of the way that a vinyasa practice works where there's many postures that flow into one another, mm-hmm. you know, you're down dogging, you're chaturanga, you're up, you're down. There's not a clear separate transition or delineation between each posture. You know, it was harder for me to flow. Uh, and then when we did stuff on the left side, I was, I was like looking at the teacher like, all right, what do I do now? They're like, well, you can just do the right side twice or, you know, just go in a child's pose or do it. You know, and there really wasn't a clear uh, direction, you know, in that for me. And these uh, were group classes that you were? These were group classes, right. They were in privates at, the, at that point. And then uh, one day after an acupuncture session, my, my acupuncturist um, actually worked out of the, uh, worked out of the, uh, uh, one of the treatment rooms in, uh, in a building that uh, had a, uh, a Hatha yoga school, a Bikram method yoga school, in uh in the building and she said to me after class one day listen i know you're doing this other kind of yoga why don't you try this yoga the heat's a little bit more intense there's uh there's no arm balancing there's a clear transition between each posture you know it's a series of postures in a very specific order taught in a very specific way uh and it's kind of like acupuncture that you do on yourself through a series of tourniquets, you cut off blood flow to all the different areas of your body while holding these postures in stillness and breathing for 20 seconds, 30 seconds. And after doing this practice for a certain period of time, your body returns to homeostasis. Things start to function the way they're supposed to, your organs, your liver, your kidneys, your spleen, everything just starts to process things the way that it should. And you just start to feel better. Um, so I'm like, sure, why not? I'll try this yoga. Um, I went into the class and it was 105 degrees, 40% humidity. This place had heated floors, so it wasn't even blowing down on me. It was heating up from the floor. So you felt like you were cooking like an egg. Uh, there was no music. There was no warm, fuzzy feelings. Nobody told me how awesome I was or, oh my God, you're great. It was like someone like punched me in the face. And I was like, holy shit, I, I finished this class. I walked out of the room. I said, I'm never coming back. I hated it. And, and wow. about maybe 10, 15 minutes later, I could not deny that 
I felt better. And I live at between a six or a seven on that proverbial, you know, zero to 10 scale, or I live between yellow and orange if you're doing the color thing, you know, and um, I finished that very first class and I went from my six or a seven down to like a three or a four for like an hour. And it doesn't sound like much to someone who doesn't know what it's like to live in pain. It's like, all right, well, you felt a little better for a few minutes. It was like, oh my God, I felt like I found a needle in a stack of needles, not in a haystack because I had been searching and searching and searching acupuncture, Reiki, cranial sacral therapy, all these things. So I felt like I finally found something that, that helped me. Yeah. Would you say it helped on like, not just the physical level, but the mental and emotional level too, with what you're That's Tierney, that's the beautiful thing. You know, I came into this yoga looking for physical pain relief. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what it was for. That's the only reason I went in there. And, you know, after three, four months, you know, I went from going a couple days a week to three or four days a week to then I was going every day and it just became a part of my day, like brushing my teeth. And it was, it's become the basis, the foundation of everything that I do. And about six months into it, the silver lining was the mental, the spiritual, the emotional clarity that I found instilling my mind for 90 minutes. You know, they call this, this practice, this series, a 90 minute open eyed moving meditation, you know, finding stillness in your mind through movement of your physical body. And, and once that kicked in, it was, I was done. I was like, oh my God, this is the point. The physical pain relief, that's great. This is the good stuff. This is, this is why, you know, people do this same series for 30, 40, 50 years. It's a beginner series. And, and that's what the, you know, it's like the runner's high, the endorphins kicking in after a long run. It's after, you know, it's finding that place of, of stillness in your mind where time is irrelevant. You know, there's mm-hmm. days that 90 minutes in that room goes by in 20. There's days that 90 minutes in that room goes by in three hours, because <laughs> depending on what you're bringing in there with you, you know, if your head's filled with lots of crap and you're coming in there and you can't still your mind, that time goes by. Like when you're a kid looking at the clock in school going, Oh my God, could it move any slower? When am I going to get out for recess? It's like mm-hmm. that. Versus days that you're like, oh my God, it's over already. I, I can't believe that was 90 minutes. How can that be? How do you yeah, and, oh, go ahead. Tim. Well, um, I mean, that yoga is so different than what I was first introduced to as yoga because I was the yoga studio or it was the warm and fuzzy, lots of music, the positive. And I, and I love that. Don't don't get me wrong. I, I'm, mm-hmm. not, no, I'm not downing. Listen, I don't think there's any bad yoga out there. Mm-hmm. I think yoga is wonderful. And people take from it what they need. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, this style just worked for my situation, you know? And so was it enjoyable, like right, like in it, or was it more the benefits after? Because I mean, some people it sounds like that's miserable, you know? (laughs) Not at all. No, it wasn't enjoyable at all. Uh, (laughs) And, you know, it's, I call that room, you know, when I teach, uh, a subtraction chamber. You have to peel everything away. What can you take away and still maintain your peace and your stillness? It's a room that it's just you and the mirror. There's nothing else. And the more you can peel away, the faster you could peel it away is the faster you could still your mind and find that space where, you know, you could, you can be still. And once you learn to do that, you know, on the four corners of your mat in that, you know, 105 degree room, you know, the point is to be able to take it off of your mat, Mm. out of the room, you know, into your car, which I haven't really quite mastered yet by any stretch of the imagination. (laughs) Okay. Uh, And when someone's honking at you or cutting, hold on. Yeah. Just to clarify. Can you maintain your peace right now? How about now? Still still breathe. You still still have. (laughs) the spiritual awareness that when something happens outside the yoga room that creates conflict or disharmony, can you use the practices that you use in the room when you're in the real world? 
Mm. Yeah. And, and that's the point, you know, yeah. that's why. Uh, so if you can maintain yourself in the pressure of that room, which is a, an artificial environment that is created to basically get your heart to beat out of your chest and make you sweat bullets and, and whatever, and you could still maintain your breath, you know, and your heart follows your lungs and you slow down your heart rate by slowing down your exhales. And you could take that out of the room into real life when, you know, you want to choke somebody because they said something that was so offensive to you that, and you just, you just breathe and you just kind of smile and, you know, you, you wish them namaste and you move on. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's kind of where I'm at these days uh, is trying to take it out of the room because um, uh, we're living through some very, very interesting times right now. Uh, as <laughs> you know, as uh, I'm sure you are both uh, profoundly aware, yeah. and uh, that's kind of been the focus of it. Uh, you know, these days is it's really easy to be yogic on your mat. It's mm -hmm. really easy to you know to namaste people in a room where everyone's you know in their in their bliss. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah. step off that mat into the reality of you know you know a very divided world, and can you maintain your peace? Can you you know really honestly wish good on people? You know. And, and, and not have any you know, yeah, animosity. And, and, right. and that takes know, a higher, it's know, a much higher. Yeah. And, and I'm not, but I'm love, working on it. <laughs> I love the analogy that you gave that it's like a mirror. Cause I've always thought of that. Like my yoga class is almost like a portal into my inner world. Oh, that's and beautiful. that's why, that's why it's like when you're, when you're always going inside and reflecting on your inner world, it's always going to show up in your outer world. Absolutely. So, and I know, you know, that's all that Howard's book is about is cultivating your inner world of like, who am I without this body? Who am I without these labels? Who am I at my very core shedding right. all those right. other things? And that's yeah. what we talked about last time. That's, that's when you yeah. can become more in the world and not of it, right? Because mm. you're, you're bringing forth that deeper spiritual understanding of who you are. And then you're, you have your attachments and you have your connections, but they don't have power over you anymore. You have, you have the ability to decide how you're going to master your day or your experience. And, th and that's, that's a discipline and a practice until the awareness gets to a state where you don't have to have the discipline or the practice anymore. And that's the journey that we're all on. You know, that, that's a constant process. Mm -hmm. yeah, one of my most uh, influential teachers uh, uses the, uh, the phrase, you know, it's ultimately about sitting in Lotus and noticing yourself, becoming aware of your awareness. And, and I'm not always there. I recognize now the moments that I am. Mm -hmm. And that's the place where I'd like to live if I could 365 days a year. And I know I could, you know, I just haven't uh, chosen to yet <laughs> to, uh, you know, to uh, right. paraphrase a friend of mine. Uh, but uh, yeah. You know, that's really the, that's really the ultimate uh, point of, of just. I have a question. For you. I have a question. Yeah. For you. First and, of all, Tierney, you're just move the microphone because it's just blocking your, your face a little bit from the, from the camera. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. Yeah. That looks well, better. Yeah, just so we can see you small. Cause yep. it was covering. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Covering too this is um, probably that, the size of my head too. <laughs> no, no. It's, well, it's don't weird. block your face. How are you can block your face? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so on a scale of one to 10, what was your 10 being the most, what was your happiness level working as a, a, an attorney and, and doing mortgage loans before? <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, mean, I, 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 hate, I hated practicing law every single day that I practiced law. Okay. okay. Um, so All that right. was probably like a, that was probably like a one or a two. Okay. Uh, when I owned a mortgage company, I loved the freedom that it gave me. Um, I loved uh, the kind of controlling my own destiny from a standpoint, you know, even though that was all an illusion, but at least from the standpoint of making my own decisions and, you know, living or dying by my own sword, so to speak, uh, I was probably at about a five with that. Okay. And so now uh, post, where are you at now? Oh, you know, I, experience. I listen, I get up every day. The first thing I do as I look at that mantra that hangs over my nightstand is I say, thank you every day. I'm grateful to be alive. Uh, I really honestly try to live my life. Each day I try to find somebody to help in some way, shape or form. Uh, it doesn't have to be a big thing, whether so, it's opening up a door at a Starbucks, right, whether right. it's picking up a coffee for somebody, um, any of those things, 
And uh, again, you put the number at 10. Okay. 11. I just, that, that's the 12. point I wanted to make is that, you know, yeah. there, there's yeah. purpose. And uh, Tierney, I hope it's okay if I, I bring this up. Tierney lost her, her sister um, how many years ago? Six. Six years ago. So Tierney's gone through her own personal Very sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. tragedy um, and, and also found her way to yoga. Is that correct? As the, yeah. you know, we, we talked about this on our, our last pod or one of our podcasts. Yeah. Um, briefly, we didn't touch too much into it. Mm -hmm. um, but did you also find yoga as a way to help you ease the suffering and heal? Yeah, absolutely. And same with me. I, I went into yoga for physical things. I had scoliosis, so my spine was curved. So that's kind of how I initially got into yoga. And then later on, when my sister passed, I got into it more for the mental aspect of just wanting to be able to cope with my grief, you know, in an effective way and not turn to those destructive habits. And then, you know, just anytime I was on my mat, I was able to just be with whatever it was on the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual level and find solutions. And so, and I brought that practice too into my daily life too. It's like when I'm frustrated in a situation, stopping and just like being with that feeling instead of being so reactive and turning towards something so quick, like I can feel what's coming up and that's been the most powerful thing. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. awesome. That's very cool. cool. Yeah. That's so, really cool. So again, I, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's what's fascinating, Michael, is <clears throat> where you were in your state and um, what seemed like giving up something, you know, through the tragedy and, and, you know, no disrespect, obviously, to either one of you, because I can't imagine what, it, you know, having not been through either, either one of those, um, but something else, a doorway to something else opens up that then you have the option to step into and own and work through your healing, but, but here's the real magic of what happens through the process is that you have an impact on untold numbers of people because mm -hmm. you were willing to go through your journey and reach and know there was something greater for yourself in that post the experience, find it, raise your level of consciousness and awareness. And then again, there's no way either one of you um, at different stages on your journey can know how many lives you've affected. Um, mm -hmm. But I know for a fact, both of you have affected many, 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 many. Well, it's, um, it's very kind. And, you know, listen, I never claim to understand what anybody else is going through. So many people discount themselves. You know, when mm -hmm. I talk to them, oh, my God, I'm in pain, but it's nothing like what you feel. You know what? Everybody's pain is everybody's pain. It's not a question of more or less. It's not a question of better or worse. You mm. know, uh, people that have gone through really, really tough times um, and have dealt with loss in a way that many people haven't, you know, I kind of think that we're in a club. You know, life looks very different from the bottom of the well up than it does from the top of the well down. And many people after my accident would look from the top of the well down and say, Oh, it's pretty deep down there. And from the bottom up, I'm like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's really, really deep down here. You have no idea how deep it is down here. And it's a perspective thing. Uh, you can't know until you know. Um, but, but I never try to understand what someone else is going through. I try to frame everything, you know, when I'm talking to others, as look, this is what I went through and I'm no hero. I'm no, you know, you know, inspirational role model. And I appreciate the kind uh, accolades. Uh, I just chose to get up because it beat the alternative of staying down. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and everyone has that choice and you can't make it for anybody else. It ultimately has to be you. And when you make up that mind, like I said, it went from black and white to 3d technicolor you know, full on sound fives around sound, bam, it was holy cow, lightning bolt in the head kind of stuff. And I'll, I'll never forget that moment. And, yeah. and that was when I chose to, to get up, you know? And, and also you brought it back to that moment. You brought it back to this idea of the, the letting go of regrets, like this idea that I could have, would have, or should have done something different. And this is obviously a very, very core tenant of what changed my life 
when that, that was the trigger for my transformation was just understanding that I had been searching for perfection like so many people do in the world and they think they're not good enough. So they think that if they achieve perfection in their mind, then they'll be accepted, then they'll be loved, then they matter. What they, what they don't, what the big misunderstanding is, is that they already are perfect. And so the realization of removing regret moves you closer to that idea of perfection in every moment. Again, that doesn't mean better than or worse than. It simply means that you understand your unfolding and process to each moment is perfect for where you're at. Doesn't mean you condone anything that you did. Doesn't mean you want to do it again. But you're, you know that you're in the learning process like every other human being. And once you realize that this whole idea of woulda, coulda, shoulda, or regrets, that energy evaporates. And that's the lightness. That's the lightning bolt. That's the lift of mind. Then you can start being more present and focusing on what you want to create going forward. Um, so just that's an interesting point that you had, which is very similar, um, very similar to mine. I, I want to ask you both something because you both have um, similar journeys in so many ways, right? In, in, in being here. Um, so for you, Tony, what what what's the one thing through your experience that you'd like to offer somebody listening that you learned in your wisdom of what you went through and where you're at today because of that, and what you're doing now? Mm. I think my best advice, and it's kind of going hand in hand with what you were saying, Michael, is that whatever situation you might be in for him, it was, you know, his incident could be grief, addiction. We all struggle with addiction in some way which your book talks about. Um, it could be really overwhelming when you think of everything all at once. And I think it all goes down to just mindful choices and taking things moment by moment. Like when we really slow down, we can handle things by just going moment by moment by moment. And that's been like the biggest, most ultimate lesson for me. And the most encouraging thing is like, don't look at the bigger picture, just take mindful actions towards what you do want to create and what is possible. Cause there's so much possibilities. And I think when we think in the big picture, it can be like a small scope that we're viewing of what we can achieve. Right. And for you, Michael is probably like overwhelming, just stepping into the yoga studio and that choice, like, look what came from that. So. Right. That remember that's for me. Yeah. That's awesome, Terry. That's, the, that's, that's great advice. I want to ask you one more question on that before I turn it to Michael again. Mm -hmm. um, but just as a side note, Michael, you're, you're now an official instructor for Bikram Yoga, correct? You correct. Went the, yeah. So that's been remember, about, uh, about four years. Yeah. But I remember when you were going through the training, cool. you know, and at every moment you stretch, like that fear hits you of, can I do this? Right. And when you push through now, look at how many people you've affected by being on the podium and being an inspiration. Um, Tierney, the other thing I wanted to ask you, which I think is so important for people listening, is mm -hmm. have you realized through what you went through more of a connection of how life's working actually with you? Yeah. Um, and I think definitely how the universe is always responding to your choices. Or That's, your questions. And your questions, yeah. And that when you ask a question and you have faith that the universe will respond, it does in weird ways. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, I, I had been praying over talking to God, source, whatever you want to call it, um, of just helping me get through that. And I just followed little, I stayed in that mindset of possibilities and that, okay, I'll be led to certain places. And it's like moment by moment, you're led to certain yoga teachers or people in your life that like just kind of pave the way for you. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like staying yeah. in that state of openness. Yeah. The universe it's, always has your back. <laughs> well, right. It's very powerful to work in that kind of faith with life. And sometimes people that have gone through a lot of stuff, they lose that faith or they don't believe it. And it's just life kind of testing you a little further and you, you go that one extra step and boom, everything opens up. So Michael, mm -hmm. I, going, coming back to you, what, what would be one of the main things that, you know, if you had to pick one or two, I know there's a lot of them that you could probably pick, but what wow. would be the, the, you know, one or two things yeah, that you I, would think that would just be key things that people could understand based on what you went through, that the revelation you wish you could pass on before somebody else either goes through a tragedy or, you know, just so yeah. they have this knowledge. I mean, Tony, I love what you said, because uh, I often say that to people that are at their lowest point, because I remember when I was at my lowest point, mm -hmm. and I'd say to people, because I did the same thing, 
you break things down into any increment of time that you need to, to make it to the next moment. If you have to live moment to moment, minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day, and you build up slowly over time. And before you know it, you're living week to week, and then you're living month to month, you know, Mm -hmm. and then you're in a year, and then you step back, you know, because it's not a linear process. It's a spherical process. So sometimes it's one step forward, two steps back, three steps forward, four steps back. So I love what you said, Mm because I, I mean, it really, really resonated with me. Yeah, I bet. Um, Totally. I mean, uh, so uh, for me, you know, I really honestly believe in the perfection of the universe, whether you call it God, Allah, Buddha, Jesus, source, energy, whatever those things are, and putting good out into the universe for good's sake, not because you're looking for anything in return. Mm -hmm. I do this for you. You'll do this for me because the universe knows it all and knows that fake fallacy of you're not really doing it because it's not coming from a pure place. But if you put good out for good's sake, it doesn't come back to you onefold. It comes back to you thousandfold. And I have been living in that place for almost, I want to say 10 years now of just constantly witnessing it. And I think my life has always happened that way. I just never noticed it before. And now I notice all those synchronicities, the the Mm -hmm. karmic kismet of putting this out there, of meeting you today, of all these different things. And all of those things reaffirm my belief, my faith uh, in the perfection of how this all works. And I now and have realized that there ain't no there, there. Everybody's on the path. (laughs) We're all just in a different place on the same path. And as soon as we get to the top of this mountain, there's another one right behind it. That's right. Right. But it's not about, and you hear, oh, it's the journey, it's the journey, it's the journey. It really is the journey. (laughs) And, and, and it's, and there's no mystery to that. And it's like, I feel like, you know, I, I know this secret that isn't a secret and, and it just constantly getting gets reaffirmed. And I watch these people get hit in the head with the same karmic brick day after day after day until finally you see people and I get to see it from the perch of a podium, you know, figuring out that they have the ability to heal themselves It isn't a pill, a doctor, the next fad diet, the next anything. It's you. You have all the answers inside you. That's all I do as a yoga teacher is I teach them that they already have all the answers. And then I get out of the way and let them do what they do because that's the point. And we all have all the answers already. It's just a question of when we're going to realize it. Right. And it's, it's interesting to let people go through their journey. And, and you, yeah. you, as soon as you feel that resistance point, that's when you know you have to let them. Yeah, step through. back. Right. Because, and, and this is, I think, really key to understanding and giving people space is that what's sacred to each individual is their choice, their soul's choice in how they're going to unfold time. But, but watching people heal yeah. in, in front of my eyes. That's... I've never seen it. I mean, I've watched people heal from physical frozen shoulders, torn meniscuses, things they said they had to have surgery on, you know, terrible depression, anxiety. I mean, I watch people heal in front of my eyes. What greater calling, what greater, you know, life purpose could, could someone have than to, to stand there and be a, I don't call myself a yoga teacher as much as I call myself a transformation facilitator. That's all I'm doing. I'm not doing anything special. I talk. Okay. But watching people figure out that they have all the answers, that they have the ability to heal. And once they do watch out, you just get out of the way and you just watch them go. And then it's like, Oh my God, I just witnessed a miracle again. And, and that's, uh, you know, and that's kind of what we all do in different ways. And uh, you know, I'm just grateful to be able to do it. It's awesome. Yeah, they have. They have 99.9% dominion over, over their life. Mm-hmm. There's that, there's that one tenth of 1% you have to leave to divinity, but 99.9% of it is, 
in people's control. And really the essence of, of what this work is all about is liberating souls and, and allowing them to, to own more of that creative infinite, you know, infinite essence um, for goodness and for love and for, um, uh, for the betterment of, of, of all of life, all of mankind, you know, on, you know, some of these bigger platitudes, but, um, but that's really what it's about. That's really what, what the journey is all about. And whenever I have any doubts, I get to call my best friend and ask him. So, I mean, how great is that? <laughs> <laughs> and also too, it's, um, I remember too, um, I was having a conversation with a friend and they were like, I'm almost excited for you when my sister had passed because now you have this thing to overcome. And I understood what they were saying because I think a lot of people have this idea that you wow. have to have this event for you to like have totally. this breakthrough or find this inner liberation or whatever. And it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't yeah. have, I mean, some that people can be really, really bright, like my buddy Howie over here who can learn through. <laughs> no, no, through look, I, but, I, but you I know. unfortunately had to learn through trauma because but, if I didn't okay. have this trauma, I don't think I would be anywhere near the place that I am right now in this life. Right. But using I'm your grateful. own words, using right. your own words, Michael, it's all relative, right? You don't know the quote trauma I was in for 25 years or growing up and, and dealing with Absolutely. Was, in my own mind, in your own which, mind. Yeah. Which drove me, drove me to these questions. Um, and the insatiable desire to have them answered. So, but, but I obviously, I, I respect and understand what you're saying. Um, but it, yeah, everybody's different. The, the, I guess the most important thing is, um, uh, you know, again, what, what Tierney said was you don't have to, right? Like that's the whole idea. And I think that's the next evolution for mankind is understanding that it doesn't have to take this deep, painful, horrible dive to get there through understanding will and what's in front of you you can have the courage to open your mind. And as more people guide, and, and there's been more and more people having awakenings that are starting to guide people um, more and more and more. This is coming into the mainstream, which is great because I think we're on the verge of a big wave of a shift in evolution of, sure. of, of consciousness um, that was started probably in the early 1920s and then the self-help movement in the 70s, which was really radical at the time. We could do probably a whole bunch of podcasts on that. That would be fun, Tierney. Um, like Est and, and um, some of these crazy things that people went through to now um, more of the, um, of, of the new wave of the movement now, which is, is definitely moving more into awareness and consciousness. If I could, the, the two words I could sum it up is just self-awareness, just because mm -hmm. as Michael said, all the answers are inside you. It's just, how do you get to a place of balance so that you can remove the distractions that allow that to surface for you? Because once they surface, that's the breakthrough. But that, that's the work in getting there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a Michael, daily struggle. It's a daily battle. It's a daily, you know, it's a daily journey. Linear. Let's it's, soften it's, it. It's, it's a daily journey. <laughs> it's a circle. Yeah. Um, so, you know. the battle every day. But, and yeah. I'm okay with that. It's, it's good. <laughs> yeah. We both, what's interesting about Michael and I, we know each other before. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we grew up, you know, we went to different high schools, but um, uh but we stayed from different colleges. He went in the Midwest. I went on the, um, out here on the West Coast. But um, wow. Well, we've seen the whole thing, which has been incredible. Um, so uh, um, anyway, I, um, gosh, um, Michael, I, I can't, again, you know this, we, we've, we're close friends, but the inspiration that you are and how you've handled it with such grace and the way that you, the great thing about Michael is you never know that he's missing a left arm because there's just nothing. He's just, and he, and he knows immediately when you meet somebody, you make someone feel comfortable right away before they know it or have a chime to register or say, Oh, I should you know, look, you know, look what I'm seeing. I should be careful. It's just blown away by his personality. So you do a great job of that, Michael, making other people feel comfortable. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's awesome. An incredible uh, inspiration. <laughs> um, Thanks. And, yeah. uh, and, and back at you. And, and as much as yeah. uh, you're inspired, uh, you know, you've helped me in, in countless ways, your books, your work, uh, your passion for what you do from the honest place that it comes is, uh, is, is just pure light. And, uh, and this is the, you know, really, I, I agree with you. We're on a precipice of uh, a transformational change mm -hmm. 
in not just our country, but in the world and how, you know, awareness is, is looked at just like medicine because, because it really is medicine, the most powerful medicine there is uh, in that creating is for change. Sure. That yeah. energy, when you tap into it, because you're tapping into the source of creative essence of the universe. And so with that power flowing through you, they talk about the chakras, they talk about, you know, the, the different ways energy flows through you. Uh, chi, it is the ultimate. Now, are there other things that help, whether it's in modern medicine or whether it's in Eastern medicine or whether- Absolutely. Um, uh, modalities, yeah, it's all part of it. But the pureness is really in, in the energy at the core. And when you get into a more mindful state, you're more tapped into that. And so- that's what really makes, I believe, humanity thrive. Um, Tierney, did you have any other further questions here from Michael as we get close to wrapping up? Michael, I can't thank you enough for sharing your story and, and where My you're pleasure. at and what you've learned. Um, mm -hmm. um, well, I first of all, just want to thank you guys both. And I was just thinking about uh, what Michael said about having the answers within. And I know, Howard, that was your whole intention with this podcast is just showing to people through conversations about how the, the guru is within. Right. And I think a lot of that too, is our emotions are such a gift. And I think that Michael, like before your accident, you know, you were struggling with this depression and anxiety and all these feelings and, and they were so valid. And it's like it almost in this accident, you were able to uncover those feelings and all those layers of depression. So that's what I try and teach in my yoga classes too, is just your feelings are like gifts. And when we go inside and sit with our feelings, they open up. It's like, we can ask and get curious about that pain, that feeling, that mm -hmm. unsatisfaction that we have in our life and dig deeper. And so that's what it, it, I feel like the answers are always within. It always goes back to like, come in tune with your feelings. Like don't, don't be afraid of them. Wow. That's a really great point. And, you know, the quote in the beginning of the chapter on emotions says that, you know, your emotions are the treasure that lead to everlasting peace. And the mm. reasons they're the treasure or the treasure map that leads you to it is that they are revealing where there is conflict in the mind. Conflict mm. either because something greater happened than you expected that shifted you to a positive state or conflict because something worse than you expected happened that shift you to a negative state. But either way, they're a signal that some belief you have within you is in conflict with the truth, with reality. And the minute that you realize that, not that you accept it or want it, but that it is, that it exists. And once you acknowledge that it exists, and this goes back to many philosophies on, on um, transformation and, and um, spiritual advancement, the core tenet is acceptance for the moment. Once you get into acceptance, you have control of the emotion because it dissolves. There's no longer any friction. Friction goes away. Therefore, the emotional reaction goes away. So yeah. that's really interesting that you brought that up because, and that you teach that because it allows people to take that trail back. Where is this emotion coming from? Where am I mm -hmm. out of sync with the truth of what life is showing me? Whether I like it or I don't like it, it is. And mm -hmm. the minute you acknowledge it, it goes away. One more quick example on this. When this, when I went through my transformation, the first thing that happened, well, I, I realized a lot of things, but one of the things I realized was that when pain hit me, I still had that same option on how I was gonna handle the rea my reaction to pain. Now, again, this is nothing like what you went through, Michael, but, but, if, but I have a, a certain peripheral blindness, so I bump into things from time to time occasionally. Um, occasionally, occasionally, <laughs> um, us together are quite a pair. <laughs> exactly, I, I'm, I'm like his seeing eye dog. His yeah. one arm seeing eye dog, and we're together. Yeah. And I hold. These look at us like we are crazy. <laughs> like, look at that one arm guy walking like with that guy who's like Mr. Magoo. What's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> it's funny, but um, so um, what I realized was like if I bumped my foot or arm or knee. The minute the pain hit me, after my initial subconscious automatic response of my body to react with energy and resistance and a yell or something, I immediately stopped, took a deep breath, and basically just gently said to life, bring all the pain you got. Mm 
right now. Bring every ounce of it. And I just close my eyes and let the pain come in. And within three to five seconds, gone. But that goes back to this idea of what we were talking about, the emotions. The minute you come to acceptance, the reason for the emotion doesn't need to be there anymore. As soon as you acknowledge the pain in the source and don't resist it, it doesn't need to be there anymore because it's trying to get your attention onto something. And so I just mm-hmm. think, I thought that was an important point to bring up um, with regards to what you said. But, yeah, it's really, really powerful. Cool. Um, Michael Fine, thank you for being here. Thank my you pleasure, for my brother. Story. We appreciate it. Um, people can get in touch with you and know how to take a class online from you. And do Bikram Yoga how? Uh, anytime. Uh, find me on Facebook, uh, Instagram. I'm One Armed Yogi. Uh, Michael Fine on Facebook. I usually post, uh, you know, when I'm teaching there. Uh, okay. Or just reach out to me via email, mfine1029, gmail.com. I'd uh, love to hear from you. Uh, awesome. Please mention that. Uh, this is where you found me, uh, just so I know. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to seeing you in a virtual class someday soon. Awesome. Thank you again. Tierney Ray, thank you as always for your presence and your great inquisitive mind and questioning. I appreciate you helping with the conversation and being a part of this. And mm, thank, you. thank you. Absolutely. And thank you to all the listeners for listening. Um, I hope this helped uh, Uh, better your day in some way and uh, increase your mindfulness for the empowerment of your life. Remembering that you always have the ultimate power over how your life unfolds from this moment forward. Hence the guru is always you. So everybody, thanks for listening. Have a great rest of your day. And I look forward to being back with you soon. So long.